Welcome to another exciting week on Postcards. Well, as you can see, I have loaded up my West Coast camper trailer, hired my trusty four-wheel drive, and loaded a couple of swags so I can sleep under the stars. Am I organised? Well, I certainly hope so, because we are about to embark on a West Australian journey of historical discovery. Well, I promised you an adventure, and this is it, the newly opened Golden Quest Discovery Trail. It's a 965 kilometre drive through our eastern gold fields. And I'm here at the starting point in Coolgardie. From this point onwards, I will be referring to my trusty trail guidebook. Now, there are actually 25 significant sites throughout this drive, and site number one is right here. Order, order. Now, over 100 years or so ago, this court probably dished out some pretty hefty punishment to those people who didn't want to toil for their gold and perhaps wanted to steal it instead. Today, it houses a local museum, and I want to show you a little surprise. Years ago, it was possible to find bottles throughout pretty much the whole region that weren't broken. It seemed that almost every product was stored in glass, from Stilton cheese to your schnapps. Now, if you find a bottle today, it's like discovering gold. And gold is what this discovery tour is all about. We've spent our first night in Coolgardie, and early the next morning, we head north to site number two. Along the way, a little bit of practice putting up the West Coaster. Experienced campers, we are not, but the beauty of the trail is that there are plenty of places to stay or camp. With that worry removed, there is time for me and my travelling companion, Desley, to concentrate on the history. The trail guidebook comes with two informative and entertaining CDs that can complement your holiday. Hello, I'm Bill Bunbury and welcome to the Golden Quest Discovery Trail. Well, we've made it to site two and it's Cunnanulling's premier hotel. Now, believe it or not, this place in its heyday was actually a very salubrious establishment and it was also the first hotel to ever in Australia to ever offer counter meals. Now, the population of 488 in Cunnanulling had the choice of only three pubs, one of those being the 25 Mile Hotel. It's believed that they were actually selling alcohol of a questionable origin, and this, it seems, provided an inspiration for this little ditty. He built a slap bang little pub, would buy a bit of gold, as whiskey, brandy, wine or gin, strong turpentine he sold. The bar was copper bottomed, whereon the boozers stood, for fear the red hot liquid might burn away the wood. One day, a drunk upset his glass, the first had made him tight, and in the twinkle of an eye, the place was set alight. A similar history can be found at Site 3, Orobanda. The little hotel here has seen its fair share of tragedy and intrigue. And that carries on to Site 4, Siberia, where a genuine gold rush occurred in 1893. There was gold, but no water, and plenty of prospectors perished. Legend has it that the name came off a carving in a tree that said, to hell or Siberia. On the setting sun, we head back through Orobanda, on our way to site number five, Goongarry. Well, my first day down and I've ended up at Calm's Goongarry homestead. And look, I know we've said it many times before on postcards, but sitting around this campfire with great company and great food, it really doesn't get much better than this. Now tonight, much to my amazement, I am feasting on chicken casserole with cheese dumplings and tomorrow I've been promised some local witchetty grubs. We did find some witchetty grubs, but watching them slowly cook on the fire left me thinking, no, nope, I'll have some tea and toast for breakfast. Goongarry town site was once known as 90 Mile. It consisted of two fine hotels, a Cobb Co station and some houses. Today, only the houses remain. Goongarry Pastoral Station is now a regeneration project and the best way to see it is by four-wheel drive with Calm's Barry Hooper. Do we, did people need to bring a four-wheel drive to do this trail, the Discovery Trail? Um, not necessarily, but they have to be very mindful of the weather conditions because the Goldfields region can have uh, large rain events in the summer and the winter is fairly consistent. 
A few of the crew have been teasing me and telling me there's a, there's a few ghost tales that go with Goongarry Homestead. Yeah, it's always good to uh, have those sort of stories and um, I must admit I heard a story last night myself and I thought well, should I be sleeping in that room, I think it's room number three where I hear there was a ghost sort of being seen in the past and someone had their, their throat tickled up a little bit but I'm not quite sure about that one. We don't want to scare everyone off here. So what have we come across here Barry? This, this is a pretty rare sight. Yeah, what we've got here is um, a pretty good example of an old mallee fowl nest, uh, something that could have been used perhaps 10 years ago. The Goongarry area straddles the transition zone between Coolgardie and Murchison Biographic regions. Calm purchased the property in 1995 due to its high conservation and landscape values. It offers a wonderful blend of pastoral history and natural beauty. We reluctantly leave Goongarry and head to site number six, the very remote little town of Menzies. Menzies was settled in 1894 by Leslie Robert Menzies and I'm standing in front of the town hall and the infamous clock tower. Now this clock tower remained clockless for a hundred years and it wasn't until New Year's Eve on 2000 that a new clock was installed and unveiled to celebrate the millennium. Why did it remain clockless for a hundred years? Well, legend has it that the original clock was being shipped over from England and the ship sank just off of our very own Rotto. So it seems for this little town, time actually did stand still. Next week on the Golden Quest Discovery Trail, we meet the mysterious stick figures of Lake Ballard. Well, we've driven half an hour north of Menzies and we've ended up here at Lake Ballard. This salt lake is over a million years old and even though it's not listed in the Golden Quest Discovery Trail as a site, it is nothing less than spectacular. Now the main attraction here is something called Inside Australia and it's the creation of a gentleman by the name of Anthony Gormley. And Anthony certainly had a vision when he decided to scan 130 residents of Menzies and then he chose 51 of those to sculpt. I'll leave you with a quote from Anthony himself. Looking out at this salt lake, these sculptures look like antennas in space. I couldn't agree more. Niagara Dam is probably our least known white elephant. It was built in 1897 and it was to provide water for the Kalgoorlie Menzies Railway and it came at a cost of some 60,000 pounds. And it never got used. By the time the dam was completed, they found plentiful supplies of groundwater nearby. And the dam, well today, it's got to be one of the best campsites on the trail. I think you'll agree with me when I say pubs are a significant part of Aussie culture and it is even more so here in the eastern goldfields. Where it seems every town site that I've visited so far, the pubs are usually the only buildings left standing. Here, the Cosmopolitan Hotel in Kukani, well, it's a stark reminder of what it was like to live amongst the mines, the dust and the flies. And after our camp out and morning fossick around Niagara, the Grand Hotel in Kukaini is a welcome relief from the rigours of travel. Publican Kevin Pusey is always ready to spin a yarn for the locals. So Kevin, when did you first come to Kukaini? I came to Kukaini for the first time about 24 years and seven months ago for a counter lunch. And you're still here? Yeah, you couldn't get away. So why is the Grand Hotel still here and everything else is gone? Well, out of the 11 hotels that were in Kukani in 1907, this is the only one that stayed open and the only one that stayed licensed. And I think it's mainly because of its proximity, it's the closest one to the railway line. OK, I hear you're actually planning on retiring here. It looks a bit that way, yeah. We um, actually decided to move out of Kukani and, and live in a bus and have no fixed address many years ago but they handed us a certificate in insanity when we decided to do up some buildings and restore them. We weren't about to spend 24 years and seven months in Kukaini, although the counter lunch worked a treat. With energy levels high, a walk at Site 10 was a must. 
The old rail bridges at Malcolm were built to traverse the sandy creeks in time of torrential rain. Site number 11, Mount Morgans. Now, in order to claim a lot here in Mount Morgans, the public were asked to take part in a race from Mount Margaret, which was the first true settlement here in the region. Now, the people who got here first obviously got to peg the best lot. And stories abound about what happened that day. I mean, you can only imagine all the sorts of good-natured trickery that these guys got up to as they were trying to make it here and be the first one to Mount Morgan. The trail turns up some unusual stories, none more so than the plight of John Aspinall, a young prospector seeking his fortune. On the 13th of March in 1896, Aspinall wrote this in his diary. For the past few nights, we've had some pretty heavy thunderstorms and this should freshen up the grass nicely. I have been trying all around, but so far without success. The country formation here at Hawks Nest is entirely different to any other field I've been on. They were possibly the last words he wrote. The very next day, Aspinall was struck and killed by lightning. And his diary, well, that's given us a first-hand account of what life was like on the goldfields. Even today, one can get a feel for how tough it was. The roads show little sign of water or relief from the sun. Later in the program, I will bring you more from the Golden Quest Discovery Trail. The town of Laverton, Site 13 on the Golden Quest Discovery Trail, was named after Dr Charles Laver, who came to Laverton by bicycle from Coolgardie in 1896. Surprisingly, there is plenty to do around here and we are keen to have a quick look at the Laverton Outback Gallery, where we were lucky enough to find local artists Bruce Smith and Janice Scott. This um, painting actually represents uh, what it was a meaning to me. Uh, Travelling across from Perth, Kogari, Kalguri, down to Menses, Lenora, and across to one of the places. Most of the paintings in the gallery show the story of the Seven Sisters, a cluster of stars represented by seven women who travel from Coolgardie to Laverton. There are also local crafts and, like the artworks, it's all available for sale. last night in Laverton and we've travelled just a short distance out here to Windara. It was here in 1970 that our fascination with the stock market really began. It was reported that vast deposits of nickel had been discovered by Poseidon Mining and this led to an increase in their shares from $1.85 to a whopping $280, possibly the most spectacular rise in stock market history. Well, 24 years later and the nickel industry here is pretty much gone. But in its place, we have the wonderful Windara Heritage Trail. This rehabilitation project, once an active mine with over 600 employees, has turned back to nature. Maybe a decade from now, this will be the benchmark for what we can do with old mine sites. Site 15 is not what you'd expect. Literally in the middle of nowhere is the current Murrin Murrin nickel mine. Nickel was first discovered in the region as early as 1897, but beyond coin making, the use of the mineral wasn't common until World War I, and then it became armoured steel. Did you know that an American president once lived in WA? Herbert C. Hoover came to the small town of Gualia as the resident mine manager. The former mine manager's house at Gwalior is arguably the only domestic dwelling in WA of major international historical significance. So Tim, what on earth would possess a future US president to come all the way out here to Gwalior? As a 23 year old um, 
graduate who was a dux of his course at Stanford University. Hoover was obviously looking for a challenge. Australia was uh, that challenge for him. He was employed by an English company, Berwick and Mooring, to uh, examine mines that uh, offered potential. At the age of 23, also had the strength of character to say he wanted to be the sole person in charge of this new mine. And uh, in May of 1898, he took charge of the Sons of Gaulia and uh, commissioned the three buildings that form the precinct here. Hoover's house is now a guest house and it's where I've decided to end my road trip for the week. Now, I know I talked about sleeping under the stars and as yet I haven't had a chance to, but tonight I get to sleep in a president's room. Next week, I'll be doing the dusty trip back to Kalgoorlie and as well as more on the Golden Quest Discovery Trail, we'll have plenty more for you. Over the past few weeks, I've been travelling along the Golden Quest Discovery Trail. Now, I started in Kalgoorlie, I've gone to Menzies, I've gone through Kukaini, Laverton and Gwalia and now I'm in Leonora and it's also referred to as the star of the gold fields. This is all that's left of the Leonora. It was once a steam tram that connected the twin towns together. Each of the sites on the trail are numbered and Leonora is site 17. The town was once a bustling metropolis, but when the gold ran out, like many towns up this way, things went very quiet. The sound of wheels on steel eventually ground to a halt. The tram ran up until 1921, with the last one being a petrol-powered motor wagon. Leonora is site number 17 on the trail, and between here and Kalgoorlie, we have a whole another seven sites. So I think we better get cracking. Granite Creek is a beautiful little picnic spot where amongst the trees you will spot budgerigars and parrots. This is an important breeding area for these species and getting close is not too difficult. Site 20, Snake Hill. This is possibly the best viewpoint on the whole trail. Today it's a little windy so it's back to the car to push on to some local controversy. Ernest Giles is often referred to as the last great Australian explorer. It was here at Yularing Soak in 1875 that he was allegedly set upon by over a hundred painted Aboriginal men. Now, nobody really knows if the attack took place because Giles himself is unclear about what really happened. So I guess you could say he's just gone ahead and used a little bit of his poetic licence. Geoffrey Dutton wrote in Giles' biography, one cannot help wondering whether the Aborigines really did mean to attack the expedition or whether it was just another one of those tragic incidents in which trigger-happy whites fired first. If you come out to the gold fields, you can't help but have a fossick around. Davy Hurst is a good place to get out of the car and feel the history. This is perhaps the most sobering of sights on the trail. Not one single building is left of a town that once boasted three hotels. Before you do the trail, I thoroughly recommend you pick up one of these, the guidebook. Now you can get them at the Tourist Bureau or you'll be able to purchase one at the various stopovers along the drive. It will certainly enhance the whole experience for you with some fascinating stories, like the one here at Broad Arrow, about a Mrs Candy Whitaker Wright. Also behind me you'll see the tower and it's the last one still standing from a hundred years ago.
over 900 kilometers and we've finally reached our last destination. It's site number 25 and it's Kalgoorlie Super Pit, the largest open cut mine in the world. Now I have had the best trip. I have met some interesting and wonderful people along the way. I've sighted some of Australia's iconic wildlife and I've learnt some of our fascinating history that is threaded throughout the Eastern Goldfields. Now, it's called the Golden Quest Discovery Trail. Don't forget it, put it on your list of things to do. Me, I'm probably back in the southwest next week and I'm guessing I'm gonna be missing all this red dirt.